Hello guys, welcome back to another tutorial. Hit the bell icon button so that you don't miss out any tutorial. Let's take a look at the sources of conflict and they come in rational and irrational forms. Let's start with the rational and the first of them is needs. When we have a need, we're driven to satisfy that need and we will do what it takes. Therefore conflict arises when our doing what it takes to satisfy our own needs impinges on the needs of others. And the other rational source of conflict is rights. When you believe you have rights and you assert your rights, and in asserting your rights you in some way restrict the rights of others, that becomes a source of conflict. And that's just the rational ones. Now we get on to irrational sources of conflict and the first of these is fear. Fear is arguably the strongest emotion. It's stronger even than love and we know how much love can be a source of conflict. And conflict arises when fear drives us to either take something away from someone else or impinge upon their rights. The other emotional source of conflict is respect. And I want to dwell on respect because respect is kind of like a social glue. It's what gives us the confidence to interact with other people successfully and build relationships. And therefore respect can be a very powerful driver for conflict. And the first instance I suppose is when we have too much respect for other people and not enough respect for ourselves. That drives an inner conflict and that's outside of the, uh, the parameters for this program. The other is when we have too much respect for ourselves and not enough respect for the people around us. And that becomes a major source of conflict. So there we have it. Some of the major sources of conflict are firstly needs and our desire to satisfy them and secondly rights and our desire to exert them. Fear, as an example of a particularly strong emotion, and we also mentioned love. And finally, respect. Too much respect for yourself, and you're likely to assert yourself over others, seizing what they need and impinging on their rights. Too much respect for others and not enough respect for yourself will lead to inner conflict. But as I say, that's for another course. We're going to focus on how too much respect for yourself can lead to external conflict. The easiest way to understand respect and its impact on conflict is to plot a simple chart. Let's draw an axis uh, upwards that indicates the level of concern you have for yourself and the horizontal axis will reflect the level of concern you have for others. And now let's divide this chart into three zones. At the bottom of the chart, where you have high concern for others and relatively low concern for yourself, that leads to passive behaviours. Passive behaviours where we're prepared to subordinate our own legitimate concerns and needs and rights to others. Which, of course, leads to inner conflict. It leads us to be hesitant to offer our own point of view, to ask for help when we need it. We're unassertive and our primary concern is to just get by. We find it hard to say no, we're uncomfortable with responsibility and our focus is on not getting hurt. Now at the other end of the chart, where we've got relatively high levels of concern for ourselves and lower levels of concern for others, that can lead to aggressive behaviour in the extreme, into bullying, even abusive behaviour. Of course this leads to conflict. And curiously, just like passive behaviour, this kind of aggressive behaviour finds it hard to ask for help. But it isn't shy in offering opinions, it's very forceful. This kind of behaviour demands what it wants and is prepared to blame others if it doesn't get it. 
Its primary focus is on winning at all costs. And this kind of aggressive behaviour doesn't take prisoners. And therefore, conflict can escalate very rapidly. In the middle, we've got assertive behaviour. And assertive behaviour is a balance. On the one hand, you respect yourself, and on the other hand, you respect others. And if those are in balance, then your primary concern is to do what's fair, to do what's right. Your focus is getting the right results. You're not afraid to ask for help, but you're also not afraid to give feedback and to offer an opinion. This kind of assertive behaviour can start to get into a conflict, but it acts reasonably in resolving that conflict. It stands its ground, but it respects that the other person may well have their own legitimate needs and desires. Instead of putting your own desires and needs ahead of others, as aggressive behaviour does, or putting other people's needs and desires ahead of yours, as passive behaviour does, assertive behaviour recognises the value of both and tries to come up with a fair and equitable solution. This kind of behaviour is all about collaboration, which means this is the place to start if you want to avoid conflict, it's the place to get to quickly if you find conflict starting to escalate, and it's the place to get into if you need to de-escalate conflict. Because assertive behaviour is about doing the right thing and finding the right way to do it. Let's take a look at how to use respect to help us to resolve conflict. The first thing is to separate the person from the problem. It's vital that you continue to respect the person, even if their behaviour is inappropriate and not worthy of your respect. So try to see through the behaviour. If you must, chastise the person for their behaviour, but don't attack them. They are not their behaviour. Remember that in times of conflict, our emotional centres are particularly active, which means that the rational centres of our brain are not so active. It's quite possible that when you're in conflict with somebody, they don't have full control over their behaviour. And you know that's true. Because I bet you've been in conflict, and I bet you haven't always had full control over your behaviour. And the other thing is to recognise that what matters is the outcomes that you and the other person want, rather than the starting positions that each of you assert. Because when we get into conflict, we are ready to negotiate. It's just that we're going to start negotiating from extreme positions. Not just our ideal negotiating position, but sometimes we want the world. Those positions are not the end point of conflict. Whilst both of you try to cling to those positions, you will never resolve your conflict. So start to work on finding out what outcomes really matter, both to you and to the other person. The second way in which respect is relevant to resolving conflict that I want to talk about is the way we use language, and in particular, the way we use pronouns. Words like I and me and you and your. Now we'll set aside all of the third person programs, he, she, it, they, them, and focus on the first and second person, me and you. Because how we use the words me and I and my and mine on the one hand and you and your and yours on the other, will leak messages about our respect for ourselves and our respect for the other person. It's kind of like each type of pronoun, the first person and the second person pronouns, have a light side and a dark side. Let's start with I and me and mine, the first person pronouns. The light side is when you use them to take responsibility, to recognise that you have a part to play. I would like to resolve this problem. The mistake was mine. The dark side, though, is when we use I and me and mine 
to hint at the fact that our point of view is more important than yours. I want this. That resource over there is my resource. Those just sound selfish. Now let's take a look at you and your and yours. The light side of the second person pronoun is when we use you and your and yours to recognise the other person and engage with them. I'd like to hear your point of view. Or I recognise that those resources are yours, but I would like to borrow them. The dark side is when we use the word you or your in a blaming way or in an accusatory way, or in a judgmental way. You are always causing problems for this unit. The mistake was yours. Why did you do that? The trouble with you is, you get the point? So I, me, mine. They have a light side, they have a dark side. Use the first person pronoun to take responsibility. And you, your and yours, they too have a light side and a dark side. Use the second person pronoun to engage and build relationships. Let's make a broad survey of the strategies available to you to help you with resolving conflict. Now, how you apply these seven strategies will depend very much on the circumstances you find yourself in, but these generic strategies are going to be useful. And within the strategies, there are also a number of tactics that you can apply, and we'll take a look at those in a later video. So let's start off with strategy number one. The first strategy for dealing with conflict is one-to-one -one chats. They're informal, they're highly effective, and they're particularly useful in the early stages. Obviously, the more conflict escalates, then the harder it is to orchestrate it. But you know what? You and me in the same room, it's often the gold standard for communication. And communication is what we really need if we're going to resolve conflict. So the secret is to prepare well and choose a setting that's appropriate and comfortable for both parties. The second strategy is formal discussions. This takes the one-to-one -one chat and puts more structure around it, often raises the stakes. Like one-to-one -one chats, it can be very effective and it's very popular in a workplace situation. Also like it, it's about choosing the place and the time and preparing well. It does emphasize the power differential. And there is a lot more at stake because after the formal chat, it's hard to go back to the informal one-to-one. -one. The third strategy won't always be appropriate, but you can sometimes raise the conflict in a more public forum, like a group meeting. Now, if you get this wrong, it can be bad. But get it right and you can harness peer pressure to help to resolve the conflict. The danger of peer pressure is that sometimes people are afraid of conflict and therefore will say and do anything to de-escalate it and not necessarily be motivated to get the right solution. But if you're confident of the group and you're confident of your position, this can be well worth a try. The danger is it can undermine your authority and it can undermine the other person's sense of confidence and self-worth. So think about it carefully, but sometimes used well, this could be an excellent technique for resolving conflict. The fourth approach is mediation. It's finding somebody who can mediate between the two parties, bring them together, separate them, represent their views to each other and make sure each is being properly heard and their positions are being properly listened to and interpreted. And related to mediation. The fifth is arbitration. Again, we use a third party, but this time they are going to listen to the points of view of both parties, their outcomes and their positions, and then they're going to make a rational judgment and make a choice and arbitrate and impose a solution upon the two parties. Arbitration 
and mediation are often used in formal settings, particularly as a step to avoid going to law. Because let's face it, the legal process is the ultimate arbiter in many countries. An extreme strategy, a high risk strategy, is confrontation. Sometimes you need to take the situation head on, you need to burst the bubble. Of course it's high risk, you need to be absolutely confident of your ground, you need to know what's going to happen because it's unlikely to de-escalate the conflict and it could escalate it even further. But sometimes it can be the trigger for a resolution. Sometimes the, the shock and surprise of a choice to confront can have a profound effect on the other party. Finally, the seventh strategy is one you can only use when you have the power in the situation, and that is to apply discipline, to apply whatever external rules there are to impose a resolution. Once again, you need to be sure you're right, because this is the ultimate solution. And there's no going back. The one thing I would say is separate your use of your authority and discipline for resolving the situation and finding a solution to the conflict from your ability to use that authority and discipline to punish. You should think twice before you punish anyone in a workplace situation because the consequences of that are, are severe. However, if you can apply discipline and authority to resolve a situation, sometimes that needs to be done in order to make progress quickly when it matters a lot. So there you have it, seven strategies for resolving conflict. Pick wisely and apply with care. So, what are the steps for de-escalating conflict? Well, there's seven and they're very straightforward. The first step is to make the choice to engage positively. And the second step is then to make contact in a respectful way. These two steps together are about respecting the other person and recognising that if you don't step forward and deal with it, then you're not showing them the respect that they deserve. Now you need to build rapport. And the third step is to appreciate the courage that the other person is showing in likewise making a choice to engage with you. Listen to them and demonstrate empathy for their situation and try hard to understand it as carefully as you can. Now you need to move to step four. And this is where you both need to understand each other's point of view. You need to take turns to share your perceptions of what's going on, your perceptions of what went wrong, your perceptions of what good outcomes might be, and you need to listen to each other. Because the more you understand about each other and the longer you take to build that relationship, then the better your chances of ultimately resolving the conflict. Once you've built rapport, it's time to collaborate. And collaboration really starts at step five with working together to agree the criteria for a good resolution. What will success look like? Make suggestions, listen to suggestions, and hone it down till you get a reasonable definition of success that is a win for both of you. You need to be generous and they need to be generous in accepting that one of you may win more than the other. But if you can both get something you want from the resolution, then that will be success. Step six is then to explore options for a resolution. What could we do? What could I offer you? What could you offer me? How can we take what we've got and build a successful resolution together? And step seven is to take the solutions you've discussed and to offer a possible resolution. And when that resolution is accepted, work together to find ways to implement it and to agree a plan. Now it's time to shake hands and recognise what you've achieved in turning conflict into collaboration and a proposed solution that not only do you both agree on, but gives you both a win. What strategies can you apply to resolving conflict? 
Kenneth Thomas and Ralph Kilman created what are known as five conflict handling modes. And in fact, their model has an easy assessment that you can use to assess your preferred conflict handling mode. But for us, what's really valuable are the five modes and when to apply them. And they derive the five modes by looking at two characteristics of how we handle conflict. And the first is our assertiveness. And they charted this on the vertical axis. The level to which we express our desire to achieve our end goal. And on the other axis, they looked at our cooperativeness. This is the degree to which we work hard to build and strengthen the relationship with the other person. Now, often we'd expect this to create a four box model with high and low cooperativeness and high and low assertiveness. In fact, they give us five conflict handling modes. There's one in the middle as well. It's important to note that the Thomas Kilman model is protected by copyright and trademark. So if you want to use it properly, then you'll need to buy the assessment tools. But for our purpose, I'm just going to talk you through the principles that they put out, which have been published very widely. In the next video, we'll look at these five conflict modes and how they combine your desire to get what you want with your desire to cooperate and extend your relationship. In the last video, I talked about the five conflict handling modes in the Thomas Kilman model. And in this video, I want to go through each of those five modes, identify what it is and when you can use it effectively. And the first is competing. And competing is where you are asserting your needs over those of the other person. It's appropriate to use where the relationship isn't important to you and the outcome is. So often these reflect short-term negotiations or short-term arguments with someone whom you're unlikely to see or work with again. It's also an appropriate strategy where you must get the outcome you need, either for commercial reasons or, perhaps more importantly, because it's urgent and it's a crisis. You don't accommodate other people who you think are wrong in a crisis situation. If you know what needs to be done, then you require other people to follow you. You are in control and therefore you have to assert yourself. So the competing mode is appropriate if you have to get the result and if you're prepared to and it's appropriate to sacrifice the relationship. At the other extreme, of course, the relationship may be worth far more to you, may be far more important than the individual outcome. And in this case, why argue about it? Why fight to get what you would prefer if it risks damaging a relationship that matters to you more? A lovely example of this is if you're arguing with your partner about what movie to go and see at the weekend. Look, the reality is that what matters is that you have a pleasant evening out and you enjoy a movie. You may have a clear preference and they may have a clear preference, but you know what? A bit of harmony goes a long way and accommodating their needs will strengthen the relationship and you'll still see a good movie. Sometimes the conflict ain't worth a candle. The right thing to do is to avoid it because you know what? The outcome isn't that important anyway and neither is the relationship, so why fight for either? Just avoid the conflict, walk away from the situation. And there are two other times when you should walk away from the situation, but in these two cases, it's a temporary rather than permanent solution. The first is if you're ill prepared. If you haven't done your homework and you are not confident that you can put your best arguments forward and win in the conflict or negotiation situation. If you avoid conflict now, you can return to it when you are better prepared to get a result that is a win for both of you. And that is irrespective of the strategy you choose, whether you choose to compete, whether you choose to accommodate, whether you choose to compromise or go the whole hog and collaborate. The other time to avoid conflict is when the emotional temperature is too high 
and therefore conflict could be dangerous, it could escalate, and you won't be in control of the situation. When people are too angry, too upset, too frustrated, then no amount of careful preparation is going to help you control the situation. The best thing you can do is to step away until the time is right. In the middle of the Thomas Kilman conflict modes chart is compromise. And the nature of compromise is kind of like a draw. Neither side wins, but neither side loses either. Both sides give up something. And compromise works if both sides feel that what they've given up is fair because the other side has given up something similar. It does little to build the relationship, but it doesn't damage it too badly. And it does little to give you what you really want, but it gives you enough. Compromise is the perfect solution if both outcome and relationship are important, but they're not important enough to work really hard. If they're important enough to work really hard, then you need to collaborate, and collaboration is the gold standard in terms of achieving a win-win situation. So why wouldn't you use it every time? You wouldn't use it every time because collaboration is hard. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, it often uses up a lot of resources. And therefore it isn't always worth the hard work of collaborating. But if the relationship is of extreme value to you, and so is the outcome, then collaboration is the right strategy. And in collaboration, rather than each side giving up something equal, both sides are prepared to put in more and more into the relationship, more and more into the transaction, to come up with a solution where both feel they are gaining something out of it. And of course, by working together, you work towards conflict resolution. So there you have it, five modes for handling conflict given to us by Kenneth Thomas and Ralph Kilman. Of these five modes, it's almost certain that you will have one or two preferences that you default to. We all do. What makes them valuable is your ability to assess a situation and choose a conflict handling mode and apply it knowing that it has the best success of giving you the right result that balances your need for the outcome you want and to strengthen the relationship that matters. When we discuss seven strategies for resolving conflict, two of them involved getting help from a third party, mediation and arbitration. And in this video, I'd like to say a little about each. So what is mediation? Mediation is what the word seems to suggest. It's one person getting in the middle of two conflicting people, or three or four conflicting people. The role of a mediator is to make sure that each person is properly listened to and understood and their point of view properly relayed to the other parties. Mediators often work by starting with one-to-one -one meetings with each of the conflicting parties, understanding their positions, understanding their outcomes, understanding their way of thinking. And then they will plan a route through, which often involves sitting with two other parties in a room discussing. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's a, literally a shuttle diplomacy as the mediator talks to one person, understands their message, relays it to the next person and takes the response. And this works if you remember our model of how communication works by making sure that the interpretation is as reliable as possible. It forces the parties to confront their filters. It makes sure that distortion, deletion and generalisation don't happen inappropriately because the mediator takes responsibility for checking the interpretations back with each party. And because they are trusted by each party, then the interpretations they take to the other party can be trusted. So mediation is a valuable technique and it's particularly of use in high stakes workplace disputes. Indeed, mediation is sometimes used as an alternative to going to law. So you should be thinking about using mediation if you have 
a really important conflict where the outcome matters to both of you and you can't find a way of resolving it for yourself. In large organisations there are often trained mediators either within the organisation or available to it but if there aren't then you should be able to find trained mediators locally by looking for local registers. Arbitration is different to mediation. In mediation the mediator's role is not to form an opinion about who is right and who is wrong and what the right resolution is. In arbitration, it is the arbitrator's role to not only understand the situation from everybody's point of view, but also to create an informed point of view about what the right resolution should be. And in signing up for arbitration, you are also signing up to abide by the judgment of the arbitrator, who makes their arbitration and chooses a resolution and requests and requires the parties to sign up to that arbitrated solution and then to shake hands and recognise that the dispute is resolved. However, they have to be conflicts where the parties are prepared to abide by the resolution of the arbiter and therefore they're only suitable where the parties agree that getting a resolution is more important to them than actually seeing their point of view win out over the other party. Often arbitration comes at the point of despair when other routes like mediation have failed. And of course we understand that because if you go to a professional arbiter you know that the only recourse beyond them is the law. Judges are the final arbiter and of course because of their nature in law they can impose a judgment. So go to arbitration when you know that the only remaining alternative other than arbitration is a legal dispute. Arbitration and mediation. In the hands of trained experts they will help you to resolve conflict but with a little bit of careful thought and planning even an untrained person can deliver successful mediation and arbitration in certain circumstances. So amongst your team, mediating and arbitrating conflicts is a very real prospect. What if it all goes really wrong? Well? What if your relationship breaks down as a result of an unresolved conflict? It's happened to me. So I want to take you through a 10 step process that I call my breakdown routine for dealing with the relationship breakdown and I want to comfort you by assuring you that I've only ever had to use it three times in a 27 year professional career to date and of those three times it has worked every time. It has rebuilt the professional relationship in one case to the extent that that has now become a friendship even though we're no longer working together. So let me take you through a relationship breakdown routine that works. Works in the workplace. I've never tried it with a private relationship. Feel free to give it a go. Step one is to declare the breakdown. You have to confront the other person by saying, our relationship has broken down and I want to fix it. And step two is to state your outcome. And it may just simply be, I want to repair this relationship but it may be something more nuanced, more complex, like I'd like to get back to the point where we can work together. And the third step is to invite their outcome. What would you like? Because if the answer is, I don't ever want to talk to you again, then the breakdown routine isn't going to apply because you're not going to be able to use it. But hopefully by being honest, they will reciprocate by saying what they would like. I'd like to work together too. I'd like to repair our relationship. And now you have something in common. If there is an overlap between the two outcomes that you and they have expressed, then there is a basis for rebuilding the relationship. And that takes us to step four. Step four is to share the facts. Start off by inviting them to recount how they perceive the situation. Now their perceptions may not be reality but to them they are. 
invite them to share, listen really hard. And then when they shared, share your facts. If both of you listen hard, you'll be able to identify where your perceptions around same external circumstances differ. That is likely to be the source of the conflict which led to your relationship breaking down. You're ready to move to the next step. Steps six and seven are about commitments. Take the lead. At step six, share your commitments. Having heard what you said, this is what I commit to. And it may be something as slim as saying, I commit to listening to you in future. Or it may be a much deeper, much broader commitment. And having shared your commitments, invite them to share theirs. Step seven is where you start to explore the options. Look at what is missing in your relationship. What went wrong? What needs to get fixed? And at step eight, look for options for how you could fix it. Work together to put as many ideas down that will move the two of you together, will resolve the problems, fill in the gaps of the missing things. And by working together on concrete future-oriented ideas, your relationship will start to mend. Once you have your options, work together to sift them and sort them and find out which ones you both have confidence will move you further together. You're not looking for the ultimate solution to all your ills. You're looking for a set of options that taken together will give you a win from where you are now, which is a broken relationship. And step nine is to take those likely successful options and form a plan. Once you've got that plan, to make your commitments to work on the plan. If both of you reiterate your commitment to the plan and to the outcomes you set out earlier on, then your relationship has started to mend. It may not be back where it was once. It may not be back where you want it yet, but you have a platform. Work through that breakdown routine as soon as you can after you detect the relationship is broken. Start it by declaring the breakdown, stating your desire to fix it. And if the other party has goodwill towards you and a residual desire to rebuild the relationship, then you've got a chance. Good luck. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe the channel. If you like the video, do give us a thumbs up and share it. Also check out amazing discounts and offers on our premium courses in the description below.